Paul Beasley. BBC Radio Merseyside. And the Church of England has announced that it will allow blessings and prayers for people in same-sex partnerships in church, but it still won't marry them. The church's teaching is that marriage is between a man and a woman, and it does not currently allow church blessings for same-sex couples. In the last hour, we heard from the acting bishop of Liverpool, Beverly Mason. Joining me now is someone we've spoken to here on BBC Radio Merseyside before, Jane Ozan. It's a well-known gay evangelical who works to ensure full inclusion for all LGTB plus people, particularly LGBT plus people of faith. And I'm delighted to say that Jane is with me now. Jane, let me start by saying, surely, given the history, you're not surprised by the decision that's come out from the bishops? Well, Paul, um, I was anticipating there might be a fudge, but I didn't think it would be this bad. And, um, you know, what really angers me is that for years now, we've been presenting evidence of the harm that religious teaching has caused so many people, particularly young LGBT people growing up in conservative churches. We've had three public inquiries that are pointed to church teaching being the cause of such, you know, of, of three people taking their lives or being murdered. And what we're seeing is embedded discrimination continuing. I thought that we would get a conscience clause, that we would be able to allow those clergy who want to marry us, and we know there are thousands who do, and indeed bishops, to be able to do that. And obviously for those who don't want to do that, for them to have, you know, to act on their conscience and not do that. That, to me, would have been the right compromise. Not these sort of mealy mouths breadcrumbs of of blessings, which aren't even authorised blessings. They're just a few prayers. So it's Yes, it's a very sad day. And I know for many, they are now contemplating whether the Church of England is a place that they feel they can have a home. Do you, Jane, get annoyed by this? Because when, you know, we started to see the introduction of women uh, vicars, now we have women bishops, uh, there was a, 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 a an order put in place where clergy who didn't want to agree with this could work under a bishop who was of the same mind rather than their local bishop in the diocese in a way that's what you're suggesting that could have happened with this but the other way around so bring it in and then let the people who are not happy with it you know have a have a special route to, to do this but it's not gone that way has it no but you know to be fair both um what we did with women and what we could have done here would have been embedding discrimination And for me, you know, ultimately, we need to get back to core Christian values. God does not discriminate. God is not homophobic. God is not misogynist. And nor should the church be. And this is about justice. And it's about, um, well, the unconditional love of God for all. And I just don't think some Christians, supposed Christians, get that. It's about time we held our hands up and said we've got things badly wrong know that we've caused a lot of harm. You know, one of the things that really angered me, Paul, if I'm honest, is that we got this highly hypocritical apology from the Archbishop saying, oh, we're so sorry, we know we've caused you harm, and we know we are continuing to cause you harm. And by the way, uh, says the Archbishop of Canterbury, I can't bless you either. I'm not going to, you know, sully my hands with you. And I just think only a group of heterosexuals could get together and decide to do something so utterly ridiculous. I I was actually going to ask you about that apology, Jane, but I Mm. I think I I I know what the answer is going to be. (laughs) Sorry, I jumped Uh, the gun. Not at all. Not not, not at all. I mean, you know, that clearly, you know, the the act of the apology seems to have upset you more than even not having the apology in the first place. Well, it just shows how deeply they don't get it, Paul. I think that's... You know, for me, the frustrating thing over the whole process, and we've been in this for years now, is this what I call willful blindness, not to understand just how bad it is for a group of, you know, 90, well, 99% uh, heterosexuals or or closeted uh, gay men uh, trying to decide the fate of LGBT people. And, you know, only... If any of us had been in the room, we'd have advised them not to say what they'd said. But, of course, we weren't there to say that. So off they go and and try and do this apology, which is just adding insult to to injury. And I've called it being, you know, akin to abuse. 
We know that in abusive relationships, people say, oh, I'm sorry, and then they hit you again. And then I'm sorry, and they hit you again. So, you know, apologies only work when there is a change and a repentance and a real recognition that things can't go on. And that's not what we've had here. Now, Jane, the... Where and there are a number of Anglican bishops who support the view that you have. Are you at least encouraged by that? Well, yes, um, but I am saddened again that Moore didn't spend significant time listening to LGBT people. They did it third hand by speed reading some reports. And, you know, I, I asked the bishops who have changed their minds, what was core to that? And each of them have said, you know, sitting and listening, and it takes time, um, but to the, you know, to the harm we've caused. And that made them reflect. And it's the same as the truth and reconciliation process that went on in South Africa. You have to sit down and listen to the people that you've harmed. And I said right at the start of the LLF process, that was the only thing that was going to make any difference at all, was for the bishops to actually spend a day listening. Well, they haven't done that, and we've seen the outcome. Now, Jane, you know, you've been at work long and hard on the campaigns that you're involved with, and you've you've seen some success along the way. Surely, even though you are frustrated now, this is just a matter of time before the Church of England changes its mind. Do you, do you think genuinely it will come eventually? I'm not sure, Paul. It should that's what the country needs. It's what the country wants. It's what the majority of Anglicans want. It's what research shows. It's where, obviously, change only ever happens in one direction. So we, you know, we've seen over the years people becoming more and more inclusive and affirming as they recognise the wrongs that have happened. But there is this strong rump of conservative evangelicals who are blackmailing the church, who are talking about unity, which is a false unity because, you know, the LGBT people aren't, 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 don't seem to count. We're not included in that unity. We're not un unified. We're leaving. But nobody seems to really care. Um, so I don't know. I think there's some very hard decisions. I know that Parliament are concerned about the way the Church of England's going. Um, Synod will have a lot to say and there will be amendments tabled and I will be uh, tabling one of those amendments to see if we can change what the bishops are proposing. But um, I don't know. I, I used to think that uh, change was inevitable. I begin to believe that the Church of England is becoming a narrow sect and not serving all. Now, Jane, you know, there are a number of bodies around the country. We have the Open Table Network here in Liverpool. You'll be very familiar with that, I know. Mm. Uh, what would your advice be to LGBT plus people, and particularly those living in same-sex relationships or have got civil partnerships or whatever? You know, as Christians in their churches, what would your advice be? Well, I'm glad uh, for the support in the Liverpool diocese. You know, Liverpool has been a beacon of inclusivity as uh, your former bishop and your current bishop, uh, John, are, are, um, but Bishop Paul was my chair, as you may know, and Bishop John, very inclusive. So it is a place that's trying to do things differently. But ultimately, I think LGBT people need to protect themselves and they need to be part of an institution or a church that they know doesn't just say you're welcome and then actually puts in a lot of caveats, but actually means that. And increasingly, I'm advising LGBT people to join a denomination where they feel that they are loved and accepted unconditionally. There are some who feel they can, you know, try and struggle it on and struggle on and change from the inside. We need those in the Anglican Church. But, you know, for many, you have to follow um, what your needs are. And for too many now, it's too triggering staying in the Church of England. I myself am uh, asking the question whether I can continue to be in an institution that is uh, committed to um, discrimination and committed to being institutionally homophobic. Jane Ozan, uh, thank you so much for coming on this morning. Undoubtedly, we will be uh, talking to you again on this particular issue in the future. But for now, thank you for your contribution to Daybreak. Thank you.